<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Amika Reali. I use she/her pronouns, and I am the membership director at Law for Black Lives. Um, I am a black woman with curly reddish hair. That's about I don't know. It's shortish with a black. I'm wearing a black shirt, black glasses, and I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a colorful painting. Um, we're so thrilled and excited to have you all here with us tonight. Um, this conversation will hopefully, I'm sure, be incredibly rich and have lots of tidbits and information for you all. Um, when we thought about having this conversation, we really thought about um, young lawyers, law students, and folks who were really questioning how they can use their legal skills and training to show up uh, for movements. And, and what that looks like and how it doesn't always look like litigation. It doesn't always look like working in a firm. Um, it can really look like a lot of different things. And, and we've assembled a panel that I think really is representative of that. Um, lots of talented folks who have um, thrown down a lot and in a lot of different ways and who have all been trained as lawyers. So, I am going to turn it over to Lorenzo, uh, my colleague, who will kick it off and who will moderate the panel. So, oh, thank you for that, Amika. Um, what's up, y'all? My name is Lorenzo. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am the research coordinator with Law for Black Lives. Um, I'm currently calling from um, unceded uh, Lenape territory, also known as Harlem, New York. Um, I am a brown skinned black man. I got a black hoodie on. Um, I'm in a pretty poorly uh, lit room, unfortunately, um, with a bunch of vinyls on the wall. Pretty good vinyl collection, I would say, on the wall. Um, and so I'm really, really excited for our conversation today. Um, I think it'll be a really dope conversation. We have some really dope, really amazing panelists um, that are going to be in conversation uh, for y'all. So basically, Amika kind of touched on this a little bit, but basically, um, this conversation is going to be a little bit about how each of our panelists kind of journeyed to the law and have like navigated and journeyed within the legal field. Um, so we're especially really thinking about how our panelists have navigated the field as like radical movement lawyers, right? So folks who have like a radical politic and are really using their JD um, and their legal knowledge in a, in a very particular type of way. So we're thinking this conversation will be, you know, especially important and interesting as Mika had said for law students and um, new lawyers, folks that just got their JD, just got some legal tools and are like, what the hell did I get this JD for? How do I make sure that I'm using this um, in a way that's like in aligning, in alignment with my principles and um, helping out my people? But in addition, right, we also think it'd be useful for folks that maybe have been in the legal field for a while um, and have recently been radicalized and are kind of thinking about new ways to use their JD um, to support the role of movement, to support the role um, of folks that are you know, out here in the streets and whatnot. So in terms of structure for this conversation, um, I have a few questions for our panelists. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a 15 minute um, you know, space for some Q and A's for folks. So as you're listening in, please feel free to use the chat. Um, definitely make sure to um, use the chat for like hyping folks up, put pluses and whatnot in the chat, um, the ashes, the, all that kind of stuff, the affirmations, um, but also make sure to be like thinking of questions that we could lift up towards the Q and A section um, at the end. So that's it, I think. That's the structure. That's what we're doing. That's how we're doing it. Um, so like I said, we have some really amazing folks on the panel today. I'm really excited about this. So let's jump into it. So I'll pass it over to them to kind of like really briefly introduce themselves. And then we'll also include a little bit of information um, about each of them in the chat as well. So I'll pass it to them, pass it to y'all. Um, let's get it started with Alpha BL OG, um, Erica Perry. <laughs> hey y'all, uh, um, I'm Erica Perry. I use any pronouns. Um, I'm a black person, a uh, black woman wearing silver earrings with um, locks that go to my shoulders. I have on a black shirt that says uh, Black National Assembly. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of dark skinned, um, brown skin, dark skin. Um, and, oh, so I, shout out to Law for Black Lives, uh, <laughs> where I was able to first start practicing movement lawyering um, really soon after law school and getting my license. Right now, I am 
an organizer with the Black National Assembly and executive director of the National Community Bell Fund. And so I live in Nashville and that's uh, where I organize and practice. And I'll pass it, should I pass it back to you, Lorenzo? Or I'll pass it to um, Julian. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Hill. I use they, them, he, him pronouns. I'm currently a clinical teaching fellow at Georgetown with their social enterprise and nonprofit law clinic. Um, I'm a black uh, mass presenting person with a beard. I'm wearing a gray and dark blue hoodie. Um, I'm bald, I'm wearing some uh, earrings with a Harry Tubman pendant, a blue face watch, a few rings and a Kenyan bracelet. I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a bookcase to my right and a few herbs on the windowsill to my left. And I will pass it over to uh, Josie. Hi, everybody. My name is Josie Duffy Rice. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a writer and a journalist and a law school graduate and a black woman. I am wearing a patterned uh, red and beige dress and I have curly hair and I'm sitting in front of a yellow wall with two bookcases and a green curtain behind me. And I will pass it to Andrea. Hi folks, um, my name is Andrea James, she, her, organizational. I am the executive director and founder of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. I am a black woman. I um, am sitting in my house, in my office space in my house. I'm wearing a bright pink t-shirt that says free the mothers, grandmothers, uh, daughters, sisters, aunts, and wives, and incarceration of women and girls. And um, I I'm sitting in Roxbury, Massachusetts, where I live. So I will, is anybody, is that it? We good? That was perfect. Yeah, okay. that was perfect. Um, dope. So like I said, you know, we put a little bit of information about folks in the chat, uh, but definitely I'll also encourage you to like Google, um, look up the other really dope stuff that everyone is doing um, as well. So let's get into it. So first question we got here, right? So oftentimes in movement spaces, we have a lot of critiques about um, the law and about law school, about how it, you know, indoctrinates people into a certain very kind of like legal centric way of thinking, um, teaches people to uphold these systems of oppression, um, to gatekeep knowledge and all this other kind of stuff, right? All this is obviously very true, is very accurate. Um, it really is awful place in a lot of ways. Um, and also it's true in addition to that, right? It's also true that each one of us decided at one point or another that law school was the move for some reason, right? Um, we each decided that those three plus years would be uh, something that we decided that we would do, right? Um, so the question is, why is that, right? So what was the reasoning or the rationale for each of you um, that made it so that you thought that law school would be a good idea? Um, and really, especially thinking about what is the hope that you had um, upon entering law school? What was the hope that you had that either what law school would be like or what a JD would allow you to do? Um, and so let's start with Julian on this one. I feel so bad for making this decision now. <laughs> um, cool. So, so I'm from a pretty small town called Kankakee. It's like an hour south of Chicago. And, you know, my folks are working class folks um, who wanted something better for their kids. And, you know, amidst white supremacy, putting all these barriers on a lot of things that they wanted to do. And so kind of growing up, it was like, you know, doctor, lawyer, businessman was sort of some of the ideals around success. Um, you know, my dad, who I think wanted to be a lawyer, probably still does, honestly, uh, was president of his union at a plant where he, he did a lot of work with cooking oil. And he was doing a lot of work as, uh, you know, negotiating on behalf of the workers there. And I was just always disgusted when we talk about what was going on and the ways in which the, the law sort of helped enable some of, the, some of those dynamics. And so, you know, I always saw the law kind of as a tool you know what I'm saying? Not the tool, not the best tool, but as a tool. And so, you know, when I was at Northwestern, I, I did some student organizing work, um, but was always sort of thinking about how to support and build institutions for, for Black folks, marginalized folks who were, who were um, 
who were ignored, you know what I mean? And so I enjoyed teaching. And so I ended up doing Teach for America for a couple of years, mostly because I wanted to work on my Spanish because I um, had also applied to law school because I really want to think about how it could be a tool for re Imagine some of those dynamics and I, I thought about it internationally. So I was like, let me teach high school Spanish for a couple of years. I backpacked for about eight months through Latin America as well, because I wanted to have those experiences. I had read Open Veins of Latin America by that point. And so, you know, when I ultimately decided to go to law school, because it took a while because I wanted to make sure it was my decision and not my parents' decision, I thought I wanted to be a litigator. I thought I wanted to do alien tort statute litigation which at the time was a way that people were using to try to hold extractive companies responsible for some of the human rights violations that they were helping to support. And so, you know, I thought that I was gonna do that type of work and went into the human rights clinic and, and sort of was doing research with the professor. And that was kind of sort of what, what I thought was gonna be my path. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, let's go to Andrea next. Uh, hi, everybody. Again, um, really excited to be here after hearing uh, the overall idea uh, that brought us all together because I'm an elder in this space. I am not young, uh, but really thrilled to be included in a group of young, badass lawyers as all of the people that I'm looking at. Um, I, uh, let me see, what's the question? Journey to law school. Well, I came from this incredible family of revolutionary scholars, educator activists, I like to call them. Um, I grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, I came from a family of lawyers and doctors and uh, people from academia. My parents were, uh, my mom was a college professor and uh, my grandmother broke the color barrier for black nurses here in Boston. And I just grew up in a family of some really dynamic black women and um, that were revolutionary while at the same time serious about uh, uh, education and using it. Uh, my aunt in LA was the first lead uh, black female pediatrician of LA County. Um, and my uncle who really introduced me to the law was the first black tenured law professor at UCLA. He was a premier labor lawyer uh, represented uh, uh, workers against uh, uh, corporations and um, uh, in uh, a lot of uh, different aspects. And he also taught cost constitutional law at UCLA for 25 years and then came here back to Boston where he was born and raised and taught at BC. And so Boston College Law School. So my uncle Reg, Reginald Aline really introduced me to this. And I really had the best of both worlds. I, my, my family really uh, heavily invested in education. And um, I really had a solid education, academic education here in Massachusetts. And I also uh, grew up in Roxbury where all of my other friends were um, entangled in the criminal legal system from the time that they were children, literally. Um, and um, so, you know, that's how I grew up and law for me, because I was introduced to it and had family members that were practicing law was something that I thought, you know, we would go down to the courthouse in Roxbury at the time it was men, older brothers of our family members. And we would, at that time, they allowed children in the courtroom and we would, we were young. We were like 11, 12 and we would go down and uh, sit in the courtroom and hear these horror, hor horrific descriptions of black men that we loved. Black men who were our protectors in the neighborhood. Black men who all white prosecutors, all white criminal defense attorneys, all white judges, except for one Judge Banks at that time, um, you know, controlled those courts. And um, I just, it, it amazed me. I was dumbfounded because these were brothers who we loved and we didn't hear the other side of who these people were. And so I was immediately determined at 11 to become a criminal defense attorney. And I did. <laughs> um, so 
uh, that's what brought me to law school. And then I, I actually had a really powerful and, and, and really um, healthy law school experience because I got to attend a law school in my city, Northeastern. And, and at the time we had um, our Dean Hall, David Hall, who uh, was one at the time, I think the only black law school Dean in the country. I, I, I go back. So I was in law school in 1995 and graduated in 98. But, um, you know, Dean Hall, uh, his, his son, Rasan and I, uh, uh, law school brother and sisters, and Rasan is tearing it up here with me in Massachusetts. But uh, we, were, we were privileged um, to have a Black man as a dean of our law school, you know, who opened up contracts in 1L, our very first class with a case, um, I was the only black student in that particular section who he refused to call on because his way of teaching contracts was to say, what is wrong with this picture? And all the other white students talked about whether the person had a right to property, blah, blah, blah. And it was a case about a black man who was enslaved and was fighting for his freedom. So I had a really healthy and beautiful law school experience. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I, I hope I'm answering most of the questions, but that was, my journey to law school uh, for me. Yeah, that was perfect. I'm still shook at this, like that level of follow through from 11 years old. Like that's really impressive. Yeah, no, I wasn't playing. I, I, was, I was just amazed. And I got to go to UCLA and sit in law school classes as a child. And I, my uncle literally let me answer questions like I knew what I was talking about. So, you know, I was kind of groomed for it. But, but um, yeah, I was lucky. I was very, very fortunate to come from my family and to have those experiences as a child to know that I could accomplish that. I love that. I love how you worded that too. Um, dope. So let's go to Erica next. Okay. Um, why did I go uh, my journey to law school? Yeah, I think I wanted to be a preacher, a lawyer, or a psychologist. I was just like, I want to help people. Uh, and my backup plan was always to go to like the baby school, theology school. But I ended up at law school and um, I think I really decided it was, was it, um, I think it was uh, fall 2006, uh, Harold uh, Ford Jr. had ran for Senate uh, out of Tennessee and he lost by like 6%. So if he had won in 2006, he would have been like the first black senator out of the South post reconstruction. So it was a big deal. Um, and, and so I was really excited, he lost, I was like so frustrated and hurt. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna go to law school, I'm gonna run for office and I'm gonna change things right from the inside. And so I hadn't yet been politicized, I hadn't yet been radicalized. Um, and I think the next question is about that and so I could talk more about it, but I just knew I was gonna go to law school, uh, learn the law, uh, run for office and get inside and be able to create laws that would change uh, I think change our communities. I didn't yet have a full analysis of what that would take or what that could look like. Um, I think I have a lot more now and so don't think that's the answer. I, although I think like, you know, electoral power is one tactic. I don't think that one, you know, black lawyer from the South is gonna save us as we uh, figured out. Um, so the, I think that's how I got to law school. And I kind of was like, by the time I applied, I was so tired. I went to UT, which is like, uh, predominantly white school and I was just over white supremacy I was over whiteness like I was like I already feel like going to law school but it was the next thing I could do besides like getting a job so I went ahead and went because I had gotten in and really I had um, a strong accountability team uh, my mama who was like girl apply to law school see if you get in and my uncle had gone to University of Memphis so he kept encouraging me to apply I'm really happy I applied mostly because um, I was radicalized in Memphis. That's where I started organizing. I don't think if I had not gone to the University of Memphis Law School, and I would have had that opportunity to like say, yo, I want to be a movement lawyer. Yo, I want to start organizing from a Black for feminist lens, um, or even like then introduced in that way to abolition. So I'm grateful for that. Although I, I don't know that um, I had the right framework when I decided to go to law school. All right, thank you for that. And they, I like the, the foreshadowing of the upcoming <laughs> the question. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, no, so let, let's go to Josie to wrap us up. Sure. Um, I think I didn't really think too hard about going to law school. Um, I really wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write fiction. And uh, my parents were like, that's not a real, you know, my parents were basically like, that's not a real job. <laughs> so you have to, you know, figure out a real job. Um, they were wrong uh, and they would admit that now. Um, and I left college, I graduated from college um, early and graduated right when the market crashed. I mean, I like remember taking finals and watching, um, watching the, the, the graph where the slope just <laughs> was a full down, downhill slope and thinking like, well, now it's gonna be really hard to get a job. And a friend um, told me there was a job opening. This was six months later. I was kind of working odd jobs in the meantime. And a friend told me that there was a job opening at the public defender's office. You know, that changed the entire trajectory of my life, you know, applying for that job. It, it was, um, I had goals to do something worthwhile and valuable for people who needed it, but I did not, um, at that, you know, I was 21, I didn't feel, super, you know, extremely tethered to criminal justice as an area that I, um, you know, needed to work in. And since the first day I walked in that office, um, that changed. I think the ironic, Part about that is that I never wanted to be a public defender, mainly because there were a lot of deadlines involved and I am absent-minded. So I kept having these kind of thoughts that I would uh, you know, hurt someone by forgetting to turn in their form. So I, 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 it was never that I really wanted to do public defense, but that I understood um, the value of this work and, and you know, would walk by the courthouse every morning and see uh, the line of people outside and felt strongly that, um, this was a field I wanted to work in and that I should go to law school to figure out how to change things. Um, I, won't, I won't preempt the next question, but that's not what happened. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we can move on. No, thank you for that. So uh, I think that's a perfect segue you know, into the next question, um, which is, right, each of y'all had talked a certain way about um, how you kind of initially viewed the law in law school and entering into law school. Um, understand the law, I think Erica said as like, a, again, a very important or the important tool for change, the exclusive tool uh, for creating change. Um, and now each of y'all have much more kind of nuanced perspectives or different analysis and or maybe are doing things uh, with your JD in ways that you did not think that you would be doing it um, as a as a young and entering into law school. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if each of y'all could kind of speak to that a little bit. What was it that kind of changed your perspective or altered your trajectory? Um, and your understanding of what you wanted to do with those legal tools and legal knowledge. Um, and let's start with Erica on this one. Cool. Um, so let's see. Um, I think like my last year in undergrad, we uh, started this Black Law Student Association. And like, always, <laughs> it was just this radical group of folks who said they wanted to go to law school, maybe, but we really got together to like, study together, politicize ourselves, and then try to do some community organizing work. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we were in Knoxville, um, and it was home to me, and I had worked in the Parks and Recreation Department, so I was like, you know, I'm gonna I'm a use my work inside the Parks and Rec Recreation Department to try to, like, start completely organizing. Uh, but I've been growing a lot since. And so I was introduced to, like, Ella Baker, Fanny Muhammad, uh, Paul Robeson, and, um, the Black Panther Party in ways that I hadn't been uh, while I was in undergrad or in school. And so that is kind of what made me think, well, oh, it's not going to be me as um, me as like an individual elected official who will change our conditions. It's actually going to be through movement. Um, and so I went to law school with really a heavy heart. Um, like, I think because of the work we've done in my last year and in the kind of like break I'd had before law school, I really started to see how deeply entrenched um, injustice, white supremacy, homophobia, and like misogyny was inside of like woven into the laws, into, into society. And so I went with that on my heart. And so I like so agitated <laughs> in, in each class, uh, whether it was property or criminal law, I think even torts, I was upset uh, because it can't, I can't remember the case, but it came down to being extremely fucking sexist. Um, and so I was like, what am I gonna use this for? Um, and I 
think while I was in law school, because I was so um, heartbroken by like the place I was in and I needed to channel like my rage and frustration, I started to do um, political education classes in some of the local like middle schools and high schools, just to be able to be in community because as you know, law school can be so lonely because it's you, it's the books, and then oftentimes it's like some racist ass professor. <laughs> um, so it's just like, I need an outlet. Um, and I was away from my family for the most part. And so one of the ways that I channeled that longing uh, to feel community and longing for my people to be free was to in like doing community work. So we did, um, uh, we did like mentorship programs. <laughs> we had community meetings. And at the time I wasn't like, I didn't really have the access to a uh, community organizing train. I just knew like, yo, if we get people together, we can think about what we want to do and start doing it. Um, and so I did that. My grades did suffer. So I don't know if that's the best path, but you know, grades weren't that important to me. Um, and then it was really the uprisings, um, Ferguson uprisings that really like changed my trajectory for sure. Because um, prior to that, I think what I had in mind was like, maybe I'll do my profit law or maybe I'll um, practice criminal defense, which I think is still extremely worthy and a tactic and a way to mitigate the harm of like the criminal legal system. Um, but I, I was introduced to like, when, during the uprisings, um, after that, we started a Black Lives Matter chapter in Memphis. And because of that, I was like, oh, I want to be interested in movement. I want to be able to figure out how to use my law degree, what I've learned um, to really start to um, like play my role in movement. And so it was then that I decided to practice movement lawyering. And then I looked and looked for a job. It was so difficult. Um, and finally, like, Marbury was like, yo. <laughs> I met Marbury uh, in January of 2017 uh, and they were hiring and I was like, oh my God, I want to work there. That's exactly what I've been looking for and was hired in, um, in uh, I think in June, 2017 and not to preview the next question, uh, <laughs> but some of it is like trust your process. And, and so that's kind of what changed my trajectory. No, oh, I love that. I love how it sounded like it was very much rooted in like you and your community. Like it was very much rooted in finding a community um, and like kind of birth from there. Um, so let's go to um, Andrea next. So I, I loved what I did. Um, I uh, was a criminal defense lawyer. I uh, did a lot of drug cases for money and I did a lot of bar advocacy for no money. Um, I had a law practice ultimately after um, coming, grow, cutting my teeth at the public defender agency at Roxbury Defenders, coming into a private practice, and I loved it. Um, I had a law office right in the heart of my community, and it was used for all kinds of organizing. Um, I also uh, stepped into an area of real estate conveyance law. And I ultimately was transitioned out, um, disbarred and sent to federal prison as a result of a real estate transgression that I um, was afraid. And I'm gonna just take a privilege here as an elder lawyer. I speak to a lot of young black law students, particularly women. I wanna emphasize to everybody who is listening, um, particularly if you're just starting out or if you're a law student, find a mentor. You're gonna get in trouble. It's inevitable. Something's going to happen. You're going to make a mistake, big or small. And I want to encourage you now. I had the best, the most loving family on the planet, unconditional support and love. I, my oldest friend, we've been friends, we're 57 now. We've been friends for 52 years. You, I could not go and tell these people that I had made a mistake in my real estate conveyance, which is only a, a part of my practice I did because uh, when they came to, to gut the black community of their legacy of housing, they recruited uh, lawyers like me who weren't sophisticated enough at the time to understand that we were part of this plan to um, completely disenfranchise uh, black families um, from, from the homes that they owned. And so, um, you know, I made a mistake and then I moved money around. I controlled millions of dollars in a client I alter account. Uh, real estate client I alter account and I was embarrassed I was ashamed I came from 
the same community that I was practicing in. I was considered, you know, a, a grandmothers brought bags of fruit to me because their grandsons had been picked up by the gang unit in the park the night before. I mean, that's how we got down in my law office. It was, I loved it. Um, and I did real estate conveyance to make money, literally. Millions of dollars were made before I went to prison because it was such a lucrative niche that black, particularly black women lawyers couldn't even get a foot in the door prior to them getting to a desperate place because they were so busy building a predatory lending uh, 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 arena for banks that uh, 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 we don't even use the word criminal, but they, that, that's it. That's the epitome of, 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 of the term criminal. And so I just wanna really encourage, I, I stopped, I transitioned out of practicing law because I was forced to, because I was, in, I was indicted and I was charged with wire fraud, regardless, nothing that, nothing mattered. Nothing mattered about who I was, what happened, the mistake that I made, the fact that I was fearful to tell anybody and I was embarrassed. And so I made the situation worse by trying to fix it myself. It doesn't work, um, don't do it. But mostly I wanna emphasize, and I wrote a book about it. If anybody, I wrote a book on the prison bunk. I'm actually writing another book, but if you wanna know about my experience, it's called Upper Bunkies Unite. And um, I wrote that bunk, a book on a prison bunk and in a, in a federal prison. And I um, didn't change a word of it. There's all kinds of misspellings. I spelled Lonnie Ganea's name wrong to the horror of my mother you know, all these things, but um, I refused to change it when I walked out of that prison because I knew once I was free, my voice was gonna change and I didn't want that to happen. So it's kind of an unsophisticated, just, I just vomited all over the page of everything I was seeing on a prison bunk, but I think it is still worth reading. Um, but anyway, um, I would encourage you as young lawyers um, or, you know, anybody, but particularly young, black lawyers, because there's zero tolerance for mistakes when we make it, um, uh, to find a mentor. And it may not be your family, it may not be your best friend, because I didn't have the courage at the time to tell my parents who were doing research in Cuba um, at the time when they came back. I remember being in Logan Airport and I didn't want them to find out. And they, were, they got off the plane and we were standing waiting for their luggage and I just blurted it out. I said, I'm going to prison. And um, it was painful. My parents didn't skip a beat. They hit the mat doing everything under the sun uh, to, get, to raise support for me. But I still ended up going to prison for wire fraud for two years. Um, and I, I also want to just say, and I know I'm probably short on, on my time for this question, but I also want to say that going to prison was a profound life altering experience. I didn't need anybody to tell me how, you know, much of a change and total dismantling of the criminal legal system that we have to do in this country. Cause I, I lived it, I saw it, my family members turned into it. I live in the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, still five generations in this house. And I was a criminal defense attorney. So why much nobody could tell me about that until I went to prison and I became an incarcerated woman. That was a profound experience. And I met the women that I work and build uh, the work we do at the National Council. Our core members were sisters who were buried in that federal prison for 17 years, 16 years, 23 years, 41 years. And we uh, started to organize in that prison. So I'd like to really say my transition was that as opposed to being sent to prison when my baby boy was five months old and my baby girl was 12, um, you know, to be separated from my children in that manner in the state violence and uh, that the prison system is. My true transition was when I started to organize in that prison yard with the women that now are the founders of the National Council. Mm. Love that. And a bunch of people um, plus you up in the chat too. Um, I love how you flipped that, not, not from the state violence, but from actual, again, thing also back to what Erica was saying about community um, and the folks who you organize with. Um, let's get uh, Josie in here. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I think about Andrea's story all the time and all the ways that she's made me rethink this work. So I'm grateful to her for sharing. Um, I will say that uh, I was in my 3L year and thought to myself, like, I should not be a lawyer. I knew it. I really, I really felt strongly that this was not the, the job for me. Um, and I got convinced, uh, I had a sick family member who needed help and I got convinced to apply to one law job. Um, and I got that one job and it was an advocacy job. It was, you know, like it was theoretically not like the law law. Um, and I was also, that's where I was also working with Marbury. So uh, Marbury Hive can um, all unite here, but, uh, and she saved my life. I mean, she was a true lifesaver at that job, but I was deeply depressed and I was, deeply unhappy and not good at what I was doing. I mean, it just was not for me. And I woke up every day thinking, man, I thought I was smart and I'm not actually smart because I go to this job every day and I feel like out, I feel like this is not for me. Um, and what they, and in the meantime, I was freelance writing and I was always thinking like, wow, people seem to like my writing more than they like my, you know, my organizational skills at this, at this legal job. Um, and what happened was basically that I functionally got let go. I mean, I don't know if I would have ever taken the leap, if I would have ever been strong enough to actually jump um, because I had been so convinced that this, I, if I was bad at this, I was gonna be bad at everything. So uh, that happened and I got lucky. I stumbled across a job where someone needed a writer to cover prosecutors. Uh, this is 2015 and people were not, like the media was not covering prosecutors really at the time. I was the only person reporting on prosecutors full time as a job when I took that job. And again, it was luck. Like I, I had not done real reporting before. I had not had a real journalism job. Um, it, it didn't pay me much, but it like I was excited about work every day. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if that hadn't happened to me, I might still be trying to make this work because it was so unfamiliar to me, this idea that I couldn't um, make it work. Like I, you know, I was always like, I like school fine. I'm pretty laid back. I can make this work. And it wasn't until I was kind of pushed out to do this that I figured out that um, my skills were not being about, you know, useful or valued in the space where I was. So that was kind of the thing that really pushed the transition for me. Thank you for that. Thank you again for um, for sharing that story and sharing like vulnerability and stuff like that as well. Um, let's go to uh, Julian to close out this section. Yeah, I feel like I had a, a couple transitions, honestly, because the first one was from litigation to maybe thinking about other work and then sort of tra a transition within that. So I'll try to be brief, but during my first year, I was working with a professor that did a lot of alien tort statute work, which is what I thought I wanted to do. And I realized that the, the nexus between the change that I wanted to see in the world and like that work was just, it just felt so far apart, right? It's like this idea of, you know, awful oil company X doing something awful in country Y somebody comes over, you know, to, to sue them in US federal courts. And these cases could take like decade, you know, over, you know, over a decade. And so I was like, yeah, nah, I'm good on that. And so what I did is I, I just kind of did what I always do when there's a, a moment where I'm thinking about a transition, I just thought about what are the things that I've like traditionally enjoyed. And so one of the things that I really enjoyed about doing student organizing when I was at Northwestern was I liked the idea of like building institutions, building culture, supporting people. And so I was like, well, maybe I could do that sort of as a transactional attorney, you know, whatever that meant. I didn't know, I was a two, I didn't know what was going on. But I was still a black capitalist, <laughs> a black capitalist at the time too, which I'm not anymore. Um, but that meant, you know, helping entrepreneurs do these businesses and make some money and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, I was looking at what was possible in terms of doing that kind of work, but in like the public sector, and I really couldn't find a place where I could go right after law school. It seemed like if I wanted to do like international development stuff, 
I needed to have some some experience under my belt if I wanted to do you know other types of financing stuff. I need to have some experience under my belt. And so honestly, I took the the easy route, um, and I went to I went to a law firm. And so I went to Cleary um, in New York, and you know I went there for a couple reasons. I, I think one was you know I have my own trauma around debt, and so I was like I need to pay these loans off. I was like I'm not waiting ten years. This is not gonna happen. Now, and that was just a thing that I knew was a hangup for me. Um, two, I was already pretty nice with my Spanish, but I didn't feel like I was professionally proficient. And so I wanted to, to do that. So I was in that Latin American practice. And for me, you know, having taken an organizing class while in law school with, um, with Professor Gans and thinking about like just doing more organizing work, I thought that language was a way to also cross barriers and build, build power in ways that I thought would be important later. I didn't know how, but I was like, you know, it'll be helpful, maybe. And also I wanted to kind of learn about how really well-meaning people get coerced into doing really awful things. Uh, and, I, and that's kind of was my sense when I was in, at, at the law firm. Just a lot of cognitive dissonance, a lot of rationalizing. And for me, I characterized those years as I was, I was doing the devil's work. You know, it's just kind of point blank period. I did lots of, I did lots of pro bono, but you know, I never saw it as something I was like washing away my sins. I felt like when I was helping do these million dollar, billion dollar bond offerings, and in the disclosure documents, they're talking about, yeah, you know, we have to renegotiate these pensions and create a leaner workforce. You know, I knew that I meant that some folks, you know, somewhere in Latin America who were probably working class were gonna not have a job, you know, and, and the folks who were sort of the, the C-suite folks in these big companies were gonna be winning. And so again, kind of for me, I was, I was always like corporations are, I'm just real skeptical. Me and Josie took a class on corporations together that kind of helped cement some of that. And it wasn't really until my second year at Cleary, I read this book, Collective Courage, uh, with a couple of my comrades, Quinn, Quinn, this guy named Quinn Rollins and, and Lydia Edwards. We read it together and I learned about cooperative economics. I was like, oh my goodness, there has to be lawyers doing this work. And then I kind of cold emailed a professor at CUNY because that was the only clinic that I knew of that was doing that type of work and talked to, to Carmen Huertas Noble there. And, you know, she, she, we ended up not being able to do work with them, but she connected me to the network there in New York. And so I was going to trainings, I was going to fundraisers, I was going to conferences. And like a year within that cold email that I sent her, one of the only places in New York City that does work or quad work uh, on the legal side would just happen to have an opening. And they knew me as the random black guy I was wearing suits who was at these co-op events. And, um, and, and, I, and I say that and I'll stop to say that for folks who are thinking about making those transitions, you know, there's work that you could be doing to sort of be in those spaces to provide support um, now. And so that was invaluable for me um, because they knew me by first name. You know, I was doing trainings with them. I was asking questions, I was getting involved. And so that was like my, um, my second transition was really um, reading that book, doing some organizing work with, with Black Youth Project 100 New York City at the time, and just being like, yeah, we, we got we to gotta build something different. Um, and for me, part of the problem was, uh, was, was the corporations and the corporate form. So I was, I was trying to figure out how to, how to do the build work um, as a transactional lawyer. Thank you for that. I feel like that really gets us into the next question really well, too. So like you kind of talked about um, this tension that it felt like it had, had happened post law school, um, where you're in a, a position where you're making a lot of money. And like you talked about, um, overcoming this like trauma with debt, um, but working for an organization that maybe is not in alignment with your own passions, your own values, your own interests. Um, I'm wondering, and, and this really like speaks to this kind of like this, um, dichotomy, I think that gets set up in law school oftentimes, right. Where you either have to like go get your bag, go get your money, or you choose something that you really care deeply about and are really, really passionate about, right? Um, and there's this idea that you have to make a choice between the two of them um, once you enter into law school. I'm wondering like what folks' thoughts are on that. Like, is that actually, is that actually a choice that people have to make? Is that dichotomy kind of like a, a legitimate thing? And like, how have y'all kind of navigated that tension that oftentimes gets, um, gets kind of pushed onto like young law, law school students and um, people that are new in the legal field? 
Yeah, go ahead, Josie. Um, yeah, I think this is a really important question because I remember when I was in law school, there was like a, a meeting that they did at the Public Interest Association about post-law school jobs and someone um, who was not black commented that they were disappointed to not see many black faces at this public interest meeting. Um, and to me, I've always felt like the fact that I could go do a public interest job was, uh, you know, privilege. I didn't have, you know, kids or parents that I was taking care of. I didn't have uh, that sort of, sorry, if you hear a baby crying, that's my baby. She's, I'm sorry. Um, she's sick and really wants to make her presence known. Um, so uh, I, and, and I think that that's lost on a lot of students that don't have that kind of, um, you know, burden that like the choice of going into work that pays you very little and where you're barely making it each month depends on the idea of like, who do you have on your payroll? Um, and th that's a big difference for like a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, especially black students, I think, um, in law schools. Um, but I will say that like, I'm not sure there's a good answer to this, right? And I say that to be honest, because I, I, I wish someone had been more honest with me hearing Julian say like, he went for a few years to this firm and then like made a change is I think, I mean, to me, the best possible way to handle this, because I don't know a job you get out of law school where you're making remotely firm money <laughs> to do work that isn't firm work, right? I don't know that job. And so um, I think a couple of years down the road, like some things can shift. I mean, but I feel like I've, I have, um, you know, worked hard, made like written a lot, tried to do as much as I can in the seven years I, since I graduated from law school, eight years, I don't know what year it is, don't tell me. Um, and uh, I am still, you know, every month is still hard. Like it has not gotten that much better. Um, and so I say that because these sacrifices are real and the structure of um, our, you know, the employment opportunities are, is real. It doesn't mean it's, it is not surmountable, but um, I think I thought, well, something will work out where I will make firm money, but not have to do firm work. And that has not been the case for me. It's been worth it. I choose this every time, right? But I mean, I'll be paying off my loans till I'm, you know, whatever. I, I, my loan money is so big now that I just kind of, it's like monopoly money. I'm like, whatever, it's, it's, it's over. It's past the point of being like me even being able to process the number. So I, I actually doesn't even, stress me out anymore, but, um, you know, I think this is a sacrifice of a choice, uh, and you, um, to imagine that there's a path where there isn't something being sacrificed, I think my, at least in my experience, is, is not realistic. Sorry, that's a dark answer, but it's honest. Yeah, no, honest, most important, honestly. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Erica and Andrea, if y'all have thoughts on this, like, idea of sacrifice. Um, yeah, I think of it in two ways. Um, one way I, I didn't know what it meant to ball. Like, you know, we're working middle class, so we like, I was happy with, I, when I got out of law school, I was like 26, I was like, a salary with benefits? Cool, just pay me something where I can, you know, pay rent. And at the time I had like a, um, a partner, so I was able to split bills, so I was in a different position. Um, and I knew that if, you know, she hit the fan, I could go home. So that is like, a you know, a privilege, I guess, for lack of a better word, that I knew I could go home uh, so I could make that sacrifice. But also think about it in the sense of, um, I just I feel like, and I think about like Black people just suffering so much, especially when it came to like the criminal legal system, especially when it comes to the prison industrial complex and the housing crisis and medical crisis and education. I just, long so much for freedom that I was like, whatever the fuck I gotta do, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure it out. Um now is my mom gonna have to help me a little bit. <laughs> yes, which again is a privilege because I'm like, uh, mom, I need like three hundred dollars this month to make rent. Um and I haven't yet had to do that. Uh thankfully um I've been able to uh have jobs where I, I've I've been able to meet my needs and travel and do things. I also don't have children so I'm not sure how much that changes things. But um I 
and this is maybe idealistic, but uh, I I think if we're grounded really in what we're longing for, our hearts are longing for, and for me it's been freedom, I'm like, I, I expect that things will line up. And if it doesn't, I hope that there's community um, that we can lean on uh, to start to care for each other. So, and, I, and a part of law school and being a lawyer is like this isolation where it's like, you gotta make it look like you got your shit together. And it's like, no, like let's lean into community uh, so that we can actually begin to transform our conditions. So I think that would be my answer. I mean, I just, I just add, you know, again, I grew up in this beautiful black community and that was mostly led by black women who made it happen by any means necessary. And I never felt, I mean, we weren't wealthy. I always say we were wealthy in, in education and opportunity and experience. Like we went to Senegal and places like that. In this, it, I, to this day, I mean, my parents weren't wealthy. They, you know, were on an education, educated salary, but they made their priorities those things, education and, and travel and experience. So I got a lot of that, but I also was raised here. And, you know, my grandmother, I was, this is a house that was, a, it's a family house. So my parents are downstairs. They're 91 and 88 right now. They're downstairs. And, you know, when I was a little girl, we lived in that apartment downstairs in this two family house. And my grandmother lived upstairs and my grandfather until he passed away. And so we were always running up and down the stairs. You, you know, we, I, you know, I was just fortunate in that sense, even though there wasn't wealth in terms of money. I mean, I went to a private school where people had heated driveways and they, the horses, you know, you know, I saw extreme wealth, extreme wealth as a child at the private school that I went to before I basically got asked to leave at 13. But when I started to become, you know, a little politicized and around the things I shared with you earlier of my people being in courtrooms and things like that. Um, uh, but um, I think there is a tension because when I was at the public defender agency, it was very challenging to recruit, recruit, recruit black lawyers coming out of law school uh, because of the money. That was the reality. Um, they didn't come, they, many of them were first generation, you know, high school graduates. Never mind going to law school, their families didn't have no money. And so they, and, and that pressure was on them as well coming out of a family that you're the first of doing this and you a lawyer, MF, you better get out there and get some money because you the ticket for us. So there's a di there's all this different, this tension, you know, but I think just ri lifting up uh, what uh, Julian mentioned. I mean, when I met Jessica Gordon Embran, that was like the sun rising, you know, and I was always um, not a capitalist, but an entrepreneur. Um, I always looked to do things cooperatively, uh, mostly because I wanted to do so much. There was no way you could do it alone anyway. Um, and learning about that history and the, uh, the chronology that collective courage provides you of understanding um, how black folk get down and survive uh, using cooperatives and, and, and cooperative economics and mutual aid and all these other things, but also how the nonprofit industrial complex sabotaged it. So over and over again, uh, the building of wealth in black communities, um, you know, the, there's no question. There are those tensions um, because we live in, in, you know, the lap of capitalism, you know, and so we're always in that constant struggle you know, um, to figure that out um, and to not be totally consumed by capitalism and greed and need and thinking that we don't have things because, you know, we need the next best thing. And we're a lawyer now and lawyers are looked at by your family as success. And if you got holes in the bottom of your shoes, <laughs> you know, and you're a lawyer, uh, like what, what are you doing wrong? <laughs> Um, so there, there's a lot of tension there, but that's why we have to mentor our young lawyers because we need movement lawyers. What Marbury did, and I sat on the board of Law for Black Lives for a couple of years, what Marbury has done to really lift this up 
in the legal um, a stratosphere is incredible because I, I didn't know what movement lawyering was when I came out of law school because I would have ran, I would have, I would have dived into that because it allowed me to do everything that I already wanted to do, but in in a in a way that was working on behalf of really beginning to address and and using my skills for black liberation. And that was such a beautiful thing that for me anyway, I can only speak for me and my experience that I was introduced to movement lawyering by, by Marbury and, and Law for Black Lives. And that to me was just pure joy. I wanted to spread the word like to, to we have to create these other ways of practicing law and being a part of the legal profession for our people. That's all I'll say. Ooh, yes, I feel that. I feel that. And I, I appreciate y'all adding like a lot more nuance into this conversation too, right? I feel like there's a way that that conversation can be had and in a way that uh, kind of casts shame um, in certain ways, but I appreciate y'all for really like fleshing out the real nuance and um, layers to it, right? So, okay. So the next question is a little bit of a, a shift in gears a little bit, right? Yeah, go ahead. Can I pop in on that question? Please, please. Yeah. Um, are you sure we got time? I'll, make, I'll try to make it brief. Um, so in terms of the tension, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person who typically tries to push against like the urge of excess. And so when I went to Cleary, um, the firm, you know, it was never about the money for me in terms of um, having to support family, having to support folks. You know, my, my folks were close to retirement. I had a couple other siblings who were doing well. And so I think I, I share some of the privileges that was that were discussed earlier and that I didn't have to provide that type of um, support and didn't have those pressures. Now that don't mean that my mom who's, who's on this call wasn't like, son, are you, are, are you sure? When I left my $290,000 job to take a $65,000 job, um, you know, in the same city. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the things that is important is that I was never living like I was making that much money, right? My first year, I was really concerned. I had never had a corporate job. Like the last corporate job I had was like selling paint at Sears when I was in high school, which I don't think really counts. And so I was just like worried about someone yelling at me, coming at me the wrong way. And so I spent, you know, my first year I lived with my brother. Um, you know, I had the, the luxury of having a brother who lived in, in the city. And then when I moved out, I lived in a fifth floor walk up, you know, studio. And so um, ended up, you know, by the time I left Cleary, you know, half of my money was going to my loans. Like I was, I didn't even see half of the money that, that I had going in. And so um, the last thing I'll say is you pay for it. You pay for it. I would say my last couple months when I was at Cleary, I was getting chronic headaches. I was really anxious when my phone would go off. I would think it's like a work email. I was just stressed out. I was like, my weight was kind of fluctuating and I, and I was losing myself. And I think that that's a, an element that isn't talked about a, a ton. I'm sorry, it's like you, you, you making the money or you're not making the money. And so, um, you know, I took, I took a vacation, didn't have any headaches, came back, first day had a headache. And I gave notice like a week, a week or two later, um, and then and that was that. And so I was able to shift to to doing the work that I ended up doing after that. Yeah, thank you for that, and the like real physical consequences of that too. Um, I appreciate that. So we had we had one question that does kind of feel like it's shifting gears, but um, I think each of y'all touched on something really interesting, like unprovoked, that I kind of am hoping to get y'all's thoughts on. Um, and it was this like this thought and this idea about mentorship. And it, throughout each of y'all's questions, you talked about how important a, a certain mentor or a collection of mentors, I think each one of y'all actually name dropped Marbury specifically, uh, but also <laughs> other mentors I'm sure that were really important and influential. Um, I'm wondering if y'all could talk a little bit about like, just talk a little bit more about the importance of mentorship and how important mentorship has been um, in your legal journey um, and kind of finding your way. Uh, I think, okay. go ahead. No, 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 please go. I think, um, I think it's really important in, to have mentors. 
um, both local and folks who are focused on your work, I think it's difficult to find movement lawyers who are your mentors, especially for Black people, uh, Black queer folks, Black trans, Black women, um, just Black people in general. Um, also because the practice is so white and then like you narrow it down to the movement lawyers, um, which, I, which is why I think Law for Black Lives is so important um, and so important as a home for Black people who are practicing movement lawyering. Um, and I know for me, when I got back to Nashville and I started to try to practice, uh, I, I found a mentor in doing some like movement lawyering work and she happened, she wasn't a movement lawyer. I'm trying to like bring her in, so I hope she's on the call. But I got a case in Paris, Tennessee, and I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Uh, it was a, um, a pretty serious case, and I talked to her once a week about the case, and then she provided me with the resources I need to navigate with, which what was a really difficult um, process. Uh, but I, I just want to like continue to re-up the work that, that y'all are doing here and how much it has meant for me to be able to be like molded, engage in political education, be sharpened. And then also to have somebody to be accountable to and a checkoff to be like, am I moving right? And that's, I think, the role of like mentorship. And it can be somebody who's been in the game longer or a peer mentor who can make sure you're right in right relationship with your people and your community. You're navigating things right. Because again, the law can be isolating, I think. Um, and so those relationships we build with our peers and with our mentors are extremely foundational. And I think like that's the work we're trying to do here. What y'all trying to do here? Because <laughs> I think it's so important. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that, you know, I was surrounded in, um, in good movement lawyers, some of which I saw as mentors and some of which I didn't. But because this was not the work for me, um, it wasn't, uh, I, I don't know how, I mean, I wouldn't say it was in not valuable, but I would say it was not the same level of value as people who feel like, okay, this is a good field for me, but uh, maybe I'm just not in the right job or I'm not taking it, I'm not doing it the right, the best way for me. Um, but what I will say was invaluable was like, um, you know, colleagues that I felt connected to and that could like remind me of what mattered um, and that I was not, you know, I was not the sum of the feedback I had gotten that day. Uh, and to me, like that made all the difference in the world for those couple of years. Um, and so just being in an environment where someone sees you, right, uh, whether or not they are have more experience or less experience or the same amount of experience as you is uh, such, such a valuable position. It makes me think of what Julian said about just being at a firm, because I imagine that that's part of the, 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 the stress of it is not feeling like you're, you can be your full self in some of those spaces, not to speak for you, but I'm projecting. I think I just want to encourage everybody to, to get a mentor. <laughs> just because um, I, they, I mean, I went through an, you know, a, an experience <laughs> where, again, um, um, you know, I, getting a mentor is an intentional action, okay? It's not like just assuming that, oh, this person moves me or inspires me. That's a good start for finding a mentor, but it could be somebody that, um, I, I, well, I guess what I, I'd like to say is I'd encourage you um, to find somebody who moves and inspires you, but you know, they don't necessarily have to be a friend. They don't have to necessarily be somebody that you, um, you know, hang out with or whatever. Make it intentional. Look at the people around you or look at people who you just kind of like met somewhere or you follow and, and you know, figure out how you're going to ask them to show up in your professional life it's going to be important. And you might not have an extreme situation such as facing prosecution, incarceration, and disbarment like I did. You, but you're going to face challenges. 
in your career, in your legal career and just anyway, but for your legal career, I wanna encourage you all, please make it intentional um, to find a mentor and don't overwhelm them. Say, listen, I'm not trying to call you every week. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to check in. And I know that you're gonna be there for me, good and bad, but particularly for the times when I feel like I may have gotten into a situation that I need to be able to come to with full transparency and say, I've made a mistake and, and you have already agreed that you are going to be that sounding board and somebody who will hold my hand and help me to make the best decisions under the circumstances. The best decision under the circumstances. And if you can be intentional, intentional about getting that um, relationship with somebody, then um, you're, you, you're gonna you're gonna survive whatever whatever and you may never need it, but do it. Yeah, uh, I'd say uh, echoing what everyone else said, just four quick thoughts in terms of how I've found mentors, because that was a question that came up. I would say one, going to conferences or subject matter spaces where people are interested in what I'm into. I think two, like when I read Collective Courage, I hit Jessica Gordon M. Hart up, right? So if you read something you know, that, you, that you're inspired by, I think that's a way, and she is, is a mentor of mine. I would say three, people will sometimes give you an offering to be your mentor. And so I would say, just be observant, whether it's in law school, whether it's a, in an internship, sometimes people say, hey, let's go out to lunch sometime. Like I would just be observant for that type of invitation. That's how I found mentors. And then I would say, finally, you know, getting on LinkedIn and seeing who's doing the work that, you, that you're interested in, what organization is doing interesting work and, and reaching out to folks that way. But echo everything else that people already lifted up. Thank y'all for that. Um, and like that really specific advice as well. Um, so we're reaching the end of the, the like kind of panel type part, right? So it's 710. Um, like I was saying earlier, we have 15 minutes now for some open Q&A. And I see that the uh, chat box and the Q&A feature is popping. So we got a couple of questions over here already. Um, I'm wondering, maybe this makes sense to touch on these ones that are already kind of asking a little bit about this mentor piece. Um, and so Julian, you already hit on this a little bit, right? Um, these two questions, one about like how to kind of find and connect. Um, and then also, you know, it seems scary. I see from Ali that it seems scary uh, and like a lot of potential for awkwardness to do this whole asking um, and finding a mentor. So I'm wondering, Julian, I know you sp spoke on this a little bit, but I'm wondering, Erica, Andrea, Josie, if y'all have any, any thoughts or advice on that. I have never once had someone ask or ask someone for their help or mentorship and have them respond negatively. I think the worst thing that can happen is someone can say like, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have, you know, uh, like I am happy to do help be helpful in this way, but I don't have the bandwidth for that way or whatever. I, no one, you know, to the extent that like life is about asking and hoping for the best, no one is going to be angry, insulted, think you're crossing a line by saying like, I think, you know, you are someone whose career or work I admire and I would like, you know, some help, uh, I'd like your mentorship. I think that's just not an unreasonable, I mean, that's a compliment to them. Um, and so it would be, I, I, under, I think that like in theory, it sounds like such a big ask, but in practice people are way more, um, you know, way more, uh, amenable to that than you maybe think. And they, people usually will find out a way to make time for you when they can. I've reached out to also tons of writers who haven't written me back. And I imagine that's because they have a lot of emails in their inbox. I try not to take that personally. And that's life, you know, like it's not, um, I don't think they're ignoring me because they don't think I, because it's because anything about me necessarily. So I would um, just encourage you to go for it because the worst that can happen is someone says no. So oh, I see in some head nodding. Um, so I'm seeing another question in the chat that actually I think is a good one to maybe transition into because this kind of gets to one of the questions that we had in the initial queue. 
Um, so this is from Natalia saying, uh, can you provide an example of in which your legal knowledge or expertise help uplift black movements um, outside of your nine to five? So get into this conversation about like, how did the legal tools and legal knowledge that you uh, gained in law school, how have you kind of used that for black movement? I'll leave it open to whoever feels. I can, I can go third on this one. Well, I can I can jump in there with that. Um, well, there there's no set. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no separation between nine to five. Um, we kind of eat, live, and breathe what we do. My um, I loved law school because I love learning. I love to read. I still do it every day to this day. I love books. I love education. I love it. And law school gave me, you know, you, you know, they say everybody who gets to law school has got to be pretty smart because it's so difficult to get there. But then they, they completely break it down and kind of put you back together in law school. And there's even more understanding of how the world works that you didn't have prior to going to law school. And that was fascinating to me. And I think that I have always brought no matter what I was the, the the substantive work that I did as a lawyer I think that the things that I learned procedurally I still carry with me to this day and I have used them to the nth degree in any circumstance I engage on the White House level I engage on the street level I engage in ways that I use the skills that I have to communicate with people and to engage with people for meaningful change. And that is something that, um, how to do that, how to do those procedural aspects of, of bringing mechanisms and, and systems and people together um, to get from, you know, it's a it's flipping getting to yes on its head right literally like getting to yes but for the movement mm -hmm. and, and and i i learned those skills in law school and i've been honing them still at 57 where i do more legal work oversee more legal work now as a in my capacity of, as you know, the ED of an organization that I built from the bone, but that does impact litigation, participatory defense, works with some of the baddest jailhouse lawyers and prisons in, on, in, around the country, um, suing prisons, we get down. And I think that, um, that, that, that really though, understanding how that, the power of that uh, came from what I learned in law school. Um, you know, my legal background has, has benefited me enormously as a journalist, uh, because I cover lawyers mostly. I cover prosecutors and, you know, and judges. And, and so I can't count the number of times people said, I mean, it's, it's been beneficial both practically and, um, just in terms of a resume. When you say to people, I went to law school and I'm writing this article, they're more likely to give you the kind of day. Um, and when people try to tell me, well, this is the way things work, I have, I have some insight into, well, this isn't how they have to work. Um, you know, the number of times prosecutors tell me, well, I have to bring this, uh, you know, I had to charge them with this. It's the law, uh, that, you know, people with law degrees tend to like, uh, not these people, not people on this call, but can often weaponize them in a way that makes everybody else feel like they're on uncertain ground and can't actually push back. That I have, a, I ha, you know, I am hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for a, a degree that allows that to be a little bit more difficult for them to do that. So uh, I, you know, I think the, I think the flip side of that is a lot of journalists with law degrees don't question the system. Every single Supreme Court journalist pretty much in the country, you know, sees the Supreme Court as a, you know, inherently legitimate institution. And so one time, some, sometimes you go to law school and you get so caught up in believing this, the, the basis 
of a system like this that you don't question it. So I think the flip side of that is that, you know, when you don't have, when you don't have a legal degree, it's sometimes easier to say like, well, why is it like this? Uh, but I, I definitely think, you know, in a way that is classist and um, elitist, it gets me into more doors because I have that degree. Erica, you wanna go or you want me to go? Go for it. Word. So I, I'll try to I'll try to be try to be brief. So I'll first step out back and say I love what Erica mentioned earlier, just around, you know, basically like being in community in some in some shape or form. And so wherever I've lived since I left law school, it's been really important to me like to find a political home. Right, some place, some group of people with whom I'm struggling, with whom I'm studying, and and from from and so I think that's sort of like my baseline. And then in terms of the sort of specific examples, when I when I was in New York, I was working with a group of um, organizers and black led organizations that were trying to build out a coalition, right? And they were trying to build out a coalition to sort of help build capacity, so on and so forth. And because I do a lot of trans transactional work a lot of the questions that come up around governance, right? Like who are gonna be the members? How is voting gonna work? What happens when like harm comes up, right? Some of the things that I learned from being a worker cooperative attorney, right? Think about cooperative governance directly apply to some of those questions in terms of thinking about different, you know, flatter ways of, of, of structuring decision-making while at the same time, you know, infusing things like, okay, how do we think about, you know, healing justice, restorative justice in the ways in which that, that might um, be helpful because the law has its limits, right? We don't want to say that, you know, the lawyer can come in and sort of just create the bylaws for this movement space and, and that'd be and that'd be the case. But I will say that's one example where it's been helpful. And I think there have been some other similar, similar examples um, in my practice. And then um, you know the last the last thing I'll say because there's there's a well I, I'll fall back because you're you're handling the questions Lorenzo. Well, okay, let me just say there's a question about toxic school environments. I would just say reach out to reach out to one of us, reach out to some other folks who are, who are doing the work that you're that you're interested in, who are inspiring you, and and they could potentially be mentors and help you navigate those spaces. Oh, thanks for that, um, Erica. You want to jump in there? Oh, I actually don't have anything there. I think what um, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, it's we live and breathe it, so it's, it's hard to separate the like um, when you aren't practicing and in service. I don't know if that's healthy, but um, that's what we do. <laughs> that's real. That's very real. Um, I appreciate the honesty too. Um, so, no, so there's a, a lot of questions left in this chat still. Um, I think a lot of them actually kind of touch on this last question that we have anyways. Um, so I'm gonna to try to ask y'all to hopefully like rope, rope your answers into um, being able to answer all these kind of questions at once. Um, but I'm gonna make this kind of like a compound question to close this out. We have about five minutes left. Um, so to close this out, this compound question is, right? What is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self, to your younger law student self um, or young lawyer self? And then also kind of roping in Blair's question as well. What is like a book, or if I could expand on that, like what is a book or something to listen to, or a movie, or something like that um, that you think that you would also recommend um, to your younger self as well? So I'll open that up to whoever feels moved to go first. I'll go um, to make it real quick. Uh, listen, if you choose to practice law in the sanctuary of uh, that legal space, um, don't, don't, don't mess up. <laughs> Just don't go to prison because don't, don't do anything. Uh, don't think that you can do something uh, because you can't. You're not going to have the, the space uh, to make mistakes uh, serious mistakes. Um, and, you know, um, the law has, you know, done some things that um, have built a movement for our people. And I, I have great respect for that. I don't want to make light at all. I take full responsibility for my transgressions. And I have deep regard 
uh, for uh, movement lawyering and um, for those who have come before us and have created uh, great strides for black people uh, because they had the tool of the law to work with. So I don't wanna um, diminish that in any way. Um, I have great regard for it, um, albeit with significant and meaningful immediate change. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of books, but more pragmatically, I would, I would say, you know, um, and Kichi Taifa just published a book, Black Power, Black Lawyer. I would say we do this till we get free, Mariam Kaba. I'd say definitely we do this till we get free. And I'd also encourage you to read uh, Invisible No More, Andrea Ritchie, read Carceral Capitalism, um, Jackie Wong, um, and then I would encourage you to uh, read a book called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, um, um, the original one, the original one. My uncle put that book in my hand when I started law school and said, this is going to be, learning about emotional intelligence is going to be one of the most important things for you. Um, I went to prison because of my lack of emotional intelligence. It's something we don't teach children and we should from the door have conversations about emotional intelligence um, and what, what that is, uh, knowing our triggers, feeling our emotions when they're moving in a direction that is gonna take us to a place that is not gonna be a good result for us. And nobody talks about it. So um, th those are the things that I would recommend. So thank you for that. So one book you said, I got an entire curriculum actually for y'all, so I appreciate that. Um, Erica, Julian, Josie, when are y'all feeling it next? And read my uh, book. Oh, go ahead. No. <laughs> um, go ahead, Erica. Oh, I think the book, uh, sounds like um, Ella Bacon, The Black Freedom Movement. I would encourage that because I think we want to be thinking about what it looks like to uh, do on the ground organizing. Um, and I think that perspective can help shape how we show up as movement lawyers. Um, and I think my younger self, I was very um, anxious about trying to find a place to work that aligned with my values and um, my developing politics. But I always told myself to trust my process while everybody else was like getting like corporate jobs or uh, doing other things. I was just like, I'm going to trust my process. And so that has carried me um, for a while. Like I ended up being able to work for um, a Black movement lawyer in place for Black Lives. It was my dream job. And so um, I, that, that got me to where I was. So I think like trusting our process and ourselves was really important. And, um, but that means knowing who we are and being clear about what we're longing for. And so uh, that requires some time alone in study um and even some practice and so those things I think that's what I would that's kind of what I did I tried to figure out what felt right uh failed got it back together and so I think like trusting trusting our process um or trust your process um and what your heart is longing for uh so that's all like flowery because that's right uh you guys are definitely going to hear my kid now because they're real loud. But um, I will uh, just say a new book that I love is Becoming Abolitionist by Derricka Purnell, who also overlapped with some of us in law school. Um, and uh, I love, um, we do this till we free us. My main suggestion would be like to also do things that aren't related to law school and aren't related to legal work because law school can become it can make it can all of a sudden become your whole world and it's really hard to remember that there's other stuff out there read fiction go watch movies that you know there, where there's not a lawyer in you know in sight do what you can to remember what your life was like before you did this and what your life can be like after um because the entire purpose of the education is to narrow your life down to this system um and it's not your life is bigger than that so uh anytime you want good fiction recommendations, I'm happy to provide them. And, and I'll just jump real quick, 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 just be on the lookout. We have the Free Her Audible books that's we're working on right now. 
We have so uh, this whole collection of books written by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, predominantly black women that no, like people don't read. They don't purchase their books. They don't read their books. We always have them at our convenings and our conferences, but we decided that we were gonna start putting them in, uh, in audio, audio form, however you say that. And so uh, we have a series of different projects under the tag of Free Her. And so we'll be sure to let y'all know because we really want folks to hear the stories um, uh, and the brilliance of the women that have written uh, books um, uh, about their lives and their experiences. So that's really coming soon, very, very soon. We're just got the tech piece in place to help us um, upload the books where people can listen to them online. Oh, thank you for that. And I think there's a bunch of books to put in the chat too. So we'll definitely send those out um, as long, along with that information as well. Um, Julian, you wanna wrap us up? Yeah, a quick, quick piece of advice for my younger self would have been just get in community, like be out in community. I think it's a lot in alignment with what Erica was talking about. Also, what Josie said, just kind of getting out of law school. And I say blood in my eye by George Jackson. Yes, it's such a good list, such a good list. Dope. Um, so thank you all so much. I think we're that brings us to our time. Um, but I really want to thank um, all of our panelists. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom, your brilliance. Um, being vulnerable and like sharing your own experiences and all of that. Um, much love to y'all. Um, thank you also to our interpreters that have been on uh, making this a more inclusive space. And thanks to um, the audience as well um, for just being here and, and being here like late on a Tuesday. Um, and I think that's it. So I'll pass it over to Amika to close us out. Uh, there's not much to say after that, except for thank you to everyone for showing up, for um, bringing yourselves, your brilliance, your vulnerability. Um, I just want to say that this is one of many, many, many of the things we do at Law for Black Lives to create spaces for radical lawyers, for black lawyers, for movement lawyers, for people who want to use their um, skills and training to help get black folks free. You can visit our website, you can join our membership. Um, you can join our list, you can follow us on um, all of the socials, and um, you can answer our calls to action when we make them. And with that said, good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.